CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400, 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. Uh, we're going to be joined uh, a little later by Ricky Cobb. Uh, that name might not resonate with you. It should, because you know the guy is an emerging star in social media and uh, pop culture analysis. He's the man behind uh, Super 70 Sports, which is a fabulous uh, account on Twitter and uh, has a new television show, which is uh, which uh, Jimmy Kimmel is behind uh, called Super Maximum Retro Show. That's on Vice. And we're going to talk to uh, Ricky Cobb about his site and have some fun uh, with him. Uh, but before that, uh, Jonah Bronstein and I want to talk some Buffalo Sabres because it's been a pretty interesting home stretch for them. You know, uh, I think that the team, by most accounts, is better than last season. And we were talking uh, roughly this time last year about how interesting it is that the Sabres weren't going to make the playoffs, but everybody felt great about the team. There was this uh, energy around them. And we were talking, uh, hey, when was the last time you ever felt good about a team that didn't make the playoffs? And now here are the Sabres. I think you could see the evolution in a lot of their young players. Uh, they, uh, however, are leaving a bad taste. Uh, and there's now pessimism and cynicism and frustration uh, surrounding uh, the Sabres. Uh, Jonah, uh, here as they head into uh, tonight's game against former coach Lindy Ruff and the New Jersey Devils, what do you think we have to, to look at over these last couple of weeks of the season? Uh, because the Sabres, based on uh, the standings and the number of teams in between them and the last playoff spot, it's a foregone conclusion, if not mathematically impossible, uh, that they're uh, going to make the playoffs. So what's left to do? Well, you're hopping on the bandwagon at the right time. You're attending the game tonight just for this late season playoff push and finish out strong. I mean, I'd rather look – I'm going to look back for a moment because as far as looking ahead, I don't know. I think it's kind of like looking ahead to the offseason, looking ahead to the future with Devin Levi as the goaltender, and there isn't a whole lot to get excited for or look forward to with the remainder of the schedule. Although, if the Sabres do get hot and win – most every one of the games on the schedule, they still are in mathematical position to possibly make the playoffs. They're only seven points out at this point, and th there's a number of teams that they have to jump. But in theory, if the Sabres went on a heater, mathematically they could compile enough points to end the playoff drought. It's just not going to happen based on the way they've been playing and the trajectory of the season. If you go back, I wanted to go back to last year, the final third of the season, how strongly they finished. Then the first two thirds of this season, if you put those games together, the 82 game stretch that that would have been is 95 points. They were a playoff caliber team over a full season, just spread across these two seasons. Now this year, they're definitely better. They're better if you watch them play and just follow the team, but they also already have more wins than they did a year ago. And with 12 games remaining, they're definitely going to have a better record and are two games over NHL 500. So still could have a winning record, but they're not going to finish like they did last year. They don't have the same vibes. They don't have the same, you know, looking at the way they were in the last two months of last season and saying this is how they're going to be next year. If you look at how they are finishing the season, you wonder if they are going to be a playoff team next year when many assume that it's okay if this team doesn't make the playoffs this year because next year and the year after, 
it's definitely coming and there's nothing to worry about. But if you're only judging on how this season ends, I think you do have to worry about whether this team is – they're too young right now to make this playoff push, and they seem fatigued physically and mentally. And it's almost what Don Granado has come out and said, that the stress and anxiety has caught up with this team and they're not able to perform at their best down the stretch. Is that automatically going to change going into next season when everybody's a year older? There's going to be a slightly different mix, and even some of the older players might not be on the team anymore. I don't know. And it's worrisome, not just that they've been losing, but the way they've been losing, the number of goals they've been giving up, and what that portends to the future edition of this team. Yeah, I think that they could stand to have some more veteran presence on the roster. And I know that it's difficult to, to want to make room when you have so many exciting young players, but they do need, I think, somebody uh, beyond Kyle Aposo, who didn't really experience a, a ton of success with the New York Islanders before joining the Sabres, but those guys who can help teach the young, young players, uh, you know, how we actually learn to ramp up towards the postseason, getting ready, uh, dealing with the grind, um, learning how to win. I mean, there just isn't a ton of experience, uh, beyond hell, these guys playing in juniors, uh, postseason, and that really doesn't compare when you're talking about going up against NHL players. And yeah, I'm sure that the arenas at the junior level or at, at the, in the frozen four uh, are fantastic. And I've been, I've watched them. I've, I've been in attendance. I've covered some um, and yeah, it's electrifying, but you're going up against teenagers uh, and going up against um, and fresh teenagers at that, because you only play, uh, you, you don't play the grind uh, like you do in the National Hockey League. Uh, but anyways, uh, I digress. Uh, I was at the morning skate today, uh, listened to Don Granado speak and, and talk to a couple of people out there uh, just regarding where, where they're at. Um, they actually seem to be pretty energized. Yesterday, I was also at the practice out at Harbor Center, um, took place there because of the Bruce Springsteen concert on Thursday. So they were locked out of their arena uh, so over at Harbor Center, and you know they they seem to be in a good mood, uh, which you know maybe if you're a fan that bothers you, but they seem to actually be in a good place. Uh, they don't seem to be uh, in a, any kind of spiral uh, emotionally. Um, well, one I think thing that's I interesting. To, well, I just yeah. wanted to, if I could just comment on that, because I do get that sense, even not so much after they lose seven one and seven zero, but the mood around those losses isn't what it would have been really in any other season of this playoff drought. And even going back to when the team was good, when Lindy Ruff was the coach and, and some of the downtimes that came with downswings and off years in that era, you know, the way this team has played, the way they've lost the before they've given up 91 goals in the past 20 games. They've given up 26 goals in the past four home games. Both of those are, if you want to call them franchise records, I don't know if you do that when things are that bad, but they're things that have never been done before in the franchise. Those the, are records. Yeah. The, the the difference between their home point percentage, which is around 400, and their road point percentage, which is over 600, they've never been that good on the road and that bad at home ever before. Whenever they've been this bad at home, they've been a last place team or close to it. Whenever they've been this good on the road, they've been a playoff team. So why is it that this team has really struggled at home lately and and, and many times throughout the season and the way they've been losing the losses that they've had, the, the stretches of losses. If this was a different year, a different coach, we'd be talking about, is this rock bottom and what's wrong with the Sabres and why will the Sabres never be good again? Should the owner sell the team? You're not hearing that kind of talk. The crowds, the crowd was light the other night. It'll probably be light again tonight, but it's not the same toxic relationship between the fan base and the franchise. So the vibes that were built up last year and earlier this season, have created enough goodwill and the way that culture is around the team that it isn't a, you know, this is how it was in the second year of coaches that got fired. And there are some rabble rousers on Twitter talking yeah, about Yeah, well, coaches, but here's it's not the thing, happen. Jonah. I mean, when I'm out and about, I'm starting to hear it about Granado. Uh, I'm starting to hear Don Granado, uh, it's, it, it doesn't have it, you know, type uh, discussion. That's That sentiment is out there that a team this talented shouldn't be bombing out um, at this stage of a season. And really it's a second time this, uh, this campaign that it's happened. Uh, they had it in November too, this big lull about where they just have, it's just a dial tone. Uh, and there's just no, there's just nothing on the other end. And, 
Um, so I've heard some of that. Uh, so the, the goodwill, I think, and with Kevin Adams and, uh, that he didn't make a big move at the, at the deadline. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, again, this is fan sentiment that I'm talking about and fan sentiment that we've discussed on this podcast. And I've written about, um, at the athletic regarding the bills, a lot of it's ridiculous. I don't think that they do need to move on from Kevin Adams and Don Granado, but I think that I, I think I would disagree with you about the, the idea of goodwill. Uh, I don't well, know that it's there anymore. The difference is a matter of degree. I think, I mean, I would say what's not there anymore is the vitriol towards ownership and team management and, you know, the same kind of people walking away from this team or, you know, radio callers having these rants about how, you know, the, how, poor the franchise has been how it doesn't represent buffalo and the hockey culture here that seems to be out of the water system for now i, I sure think so i think people notice they notice to keep the metaphor going they see what's in the pipeline uh for uh what's and they're excited about it and i think that that's where the aggravation has shifted to damn it we better not waste this good talent with bad coaching or you know management that isn't willing to make the the move when necessary because we really like Tage Thompson and Rasmus Dahlin and Owen Power and Dylan Cousins and Peyton Craig and go on down the list and Paterka. And um, whereas, hell, just a couple of years ago, it was like, gee, there was just nothing to root for. Right. And the players are more likable. The, the coach and the general manager have more likable personas. Kevin Adams being a local, I think, helps. So there's more of a we believe in these guys type feeling, I think, in the fan base than there was. Yeah. Even when they were a young team with guys like Jack Eichel and Sam Reinhart and things were looking up, but there was a lot more apoplectic reactions to those teams failing to meet expectations in the past. And as far as the coach and the general manager, there are people that are suggesting that maybe a, they're the problem and changes should be made. I think there's an interesting discussion to have about Don Granado's coaching style and how far into the future when this team is ready to contend. Does that need to change or is that not a fit for a team that is trying to win in the playoffs and play more defensive hockey like Lindy Ruff has the New Jersey Devils doing? But the degree is not the same. It's not the same clamor from the fan base as it was to fire Phil Housley or Dan Bowsmer or Jason Bottrell at, at those points in time. Ralph Kruger. Really, Ralph Kruger, for sure. You can't you can't have that. You can't uh, utter that sentence and leave out Ralph Kruger's name. Absolutely. Absolutely. And but and those were all in the second year as a coach. And in terms of the GM, it was third or fourth year. Kevin Adams is a little bit newer than it was before Tim Murray and uh, Jason Bottrell got pushed out, but not that far off. He's about a year away from being at that point in that timeline. And I don't think it's going to go that way. But if you were new to Buffalo and you were just looking at the way the team is playing and box scores and plus minus and things like that, if you just look at it on paper, you think, yeah, it looks like it's going that way again. Yeah, and I think that you can look at uh, tonight's opponent uh, in a number of ways. Uh, number one, uh, a young team that didn't seem to have it uh, last season uh, and was able to grow quite a bit, but not fast enough for Devils fans to be chanting uh, that Lindy Ruff uh, needed to be fired. And now here he is, a Jack Adams uh, candidate uh, and uh, one of the best teams heading into the postseason. Um, your thoughts on, on on comparisons between what the Sabres are now, even though the Devils seem to have maybe leapfrogged them a little bit. Um, but the and, and that's one of the things that Don Granado uh, talked about uh, at, after the morning skate was – they just didn't feel that their team was ready to make that move like the Devils were uh, based on their youth and the structure and, and whatever they had in terms of, you know, their mix of players. They wanted the Sabres I'm talking about, Don Granato and Kevin Adams, wanted their young players to have another season where it was on them and to come together before they as part of their foundation before they shift into that next year. Well, the Devils are a team that are probably a year ahead of the Sabres. They're, if you look at their roster and their makeup, last season was very similar to what the Sabres are experiencing in terms of some offensive breakouts and, and things like that. And Lindy Ruff even mentioned that earlier in the year when the Devils played here. And the Devils, I think, at that point were on – well, they were on a 14-game win streak or something like that. They were the hottest team in the league. And he had talked about how he sees signs in the Sabres 
that they're going to be similar to the Devils a year from now. And really rough also pointed to his current Devils team being like some of his old Sabres teams and clicking at the right time, that 06, 07 run or 05, 06. So, and a lot of comparisons can be made, I think, between this Sabres and those Sabres and the trajectories and things like that. So you could look at it very positively and see how the Devils are going to the playoffs. And if they win tonight, they clinch their playoff spot with 12 games remaining, 11 games remaining. But you can also look at it and think, well, maybe the Sabres aren't made up the same way in terms of their defensive structure, their coaching style, their goaltending. And I I think everybody thinks the Sabres are going to be better next year. But I think you really need a very uh, a hockey analyst smarter than myself here to figure out what are they going to do in the defensive zone and in the net next year to not give up as many goals. They're on pace to give up 308 goals now this season, which would tie the franchise record. Now that was set in 80 games, but still, this is one of the worst defensive teams in – franchise history what's going to change next year so they don't put the puck in their own net quite so often uh jonah before we get to ricky cobb um from super 70 sports uh your your thoughts on uh, ub's uh, head coaching vacancy with the basketball program uh you're hearing any names what's uh what's yeah you know well an interesting name did emerge this week that I don't think many people, myself or anybody that I've read, saw coming, but they did have on campus Ben McCollum, who's a four-time national champion with Northwest Missouri State at the Division II level, five-time national Division II coach of the year, and he's in the mix and interviewing with UB. And when I put that out midweek, um, it was I was struck more by the reaction nationally from a lot of coaches, analysts like Doug Gottlieb, people that follow college basketball saying, hey, this is – a great coach. Somebody called him your favorite coach's favorite coach and the offensive style and the system he runs and the consistency with which he's won at the division two level. It's a lot like Lance Leipold coming into the football coach from division three a few years ago with that kind of winning success. Now, I don't know if this is where he's going to land. He could probably, he could possibly turn down UB for another division one job. I've heard he might rather stay closer to the Midwest if he could. North Texas is a job that recently opened up that maybe you know, that's more attractive to him if he gets in the mix there. But it it would be an interesting hire for UB, and I think it would probably translate to more success. You look at what Tobin Anderson did as a 16th seed with Fairleigh Dickinson and coming from the Division II level and how winning at one level does seem to move up the chain, at least in college. It doesn't go college to pros quite the same way, but it, it can do that in college. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he's the top name on UB's list. I don't know if UB is really the top school that Ben McCollum wants to leave the Division II level and make his jump to the Division level at. But it would be interesting if it was. And it does go a little bit against what I had initially heard, that UB was looking for a name that would help sell tickets and create some buzz. And while this has done that a little bit in the inside basketball community, it's not a name that the casual fan is going to recognize. Right. It's not going to resonate. About. You know, the program doesn't resonate. And those are the two ways that you really get your um, your fans worked up. It's the name, you know, like a Bobby Hurley uh, or a Paulus even, you know, the, a name that, hey, I remember that, mm-hmm. or the program uh, that they're coming from, uh, that they are not, and I don't mean Bobby Hurley had played at Duke. I mean, the program that they are leaving to come join UB. Those are the two things. And and he doesn't really check either of those boxes. But to me, I mean, that again, that's superficial. Uh, and I, I would much rather uh, go with the better coach, the guy who's going to lay down uh, some roots, at least a, a little bit uh, before making the jump. Because as we talked about last week on the podcast, that's really the the formula that has worked best for, for UB is the uh, – embrace the fact that it's a stepping stone job. Um, But even stepping stones require a couple of years. The other names I've heard the most chatter about or legit chatter about is Sadi Washington, who's an assistant coach at Michigan, who was formerly a Nate Oates assistant at the high school level before he got to Michigan. Now he's the guy, he played at Western Michigan and he's turned down the Western Michigan job in the past. So I know UB attempted to make contact there and, and had some interest. I don't know how far it got and I don't know if he would take the UB job when he hasn't taken other Mac jobs before. 
And the other name I've heard the most is Adam Cohen, a local from Williamsville North graduate. He's currently the associate head coach at Xavier, which plays tonight in the Sweet 16. I know there's been some talk between the parties there, and maybe there'll be more if and when Xavier is eliminated from the NCAA tournament. What I like about him is he was a former student manager at UB when Reggie Witherspoon was the coach. And I think if he does end up being the head coach here, that can maybe mend that broken relationship and kind of connect those eras with UB basketball a little bit better in the future. Um, but he's younger. He doesn't have as much experience as, as a guy like Ben McCollum. He has no prior head coaching experience. And is coming from Xavier. Is that the big name? Is that the big program? He has a local name that might excite some people, but is that the big name that sells tickets and revives the fan base? I don't know. Ryan Hodgson was, I think. Yeah, I was going to ask you your boxes. thoughts on him being off the board. From what I understand, UB was not interested in, in talking to him at any point. They, they talked four years ago, and, and the way that was left, um, they didn't want to go back to that well. And Brian Hodgson's now got his first opportunity as a head coach at Arkansas State. And I know he's excited about that. And uh, if he proves he can win there, it, it'll boost him to another level. And, and maybe that's UB down the line. I don't know. But, um, you know, that was something that UB was not interested in uh, making happen as much as it was on the other side of that coin. Yeah. All right, Jonah, thank you for that. Uh, we'll part ways here. Uh, as I know that you have uh, things to do uh, this evening, uh, some stuff to cover, a lot of stuff to cover, but maybe we will uh, reconnect in a few hours. Uh, good I'll Lord, see really. you dancing on the scoreboard when they play the music in between. Might be, yeah. might be. Uh, all right, when we come back uh, from this uh, message from our sponsor, CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants, we will have Ricky Cobb from Super 70 Sports. Uh, stick around. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed, whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Uh, welcome back to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK CPAs and Business Consultants. Uh, as promised, we are joined by Ricky Cobb of at Super 70 Sports, and I have to look down at my notes, Ricky, because uh, at Super 70 Sports has mushroom clouded into a bunch of stuff, and it is all fun. Uh, everything from your new television show on Vice, uh, Super Maximum Retro Show, you had your own line of Topps baseball cards that sold out, uh, Golf Magazine columnist. I'm leaving out some stuff because I don't want to just get into the granular uh, amazement that is uh, at Super 70 Sports uh, that you've created. But, Ricky, thanks for doing this. I've been looking forward to it. You're welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. You you left out a uh, great lover from what I've been told. Um, but a no, gentle I, lover. I gentle, See, I do my research, caring. and what I was yeah. told was gentle lover from multiple sources uh, and uh, – I don't know that greatness came into it, but they were mostly amazed by the gentleness. Yeah, there's a lot of care that goes into it. It's like Keebler elves, you know, the cookies are good, but it's that it's that loving that went that's into true. the oven that really makes it. So that's much been my approach to love making, Tim, but that's probably another podcast. Well, there probably aren't that many things to learn or to master in Horse Cave, Kentucky. <laughs> uh, so tell me about Horse Cave. Now, I was able to find it on a map, and I know that it's roughly a Louisville area, uh, which I'm familiar with. Half my family is from uh, there and uh, Jeffersonville, Indiana, New Albany and those types of places. Uh, but tell me what there is to do in Horse Cave, Kentucky in the 70s and 80s that forms this uh, this phenomenon, really, of 40 to slash 50 years later that gets everybody worked up with your musings and observations. Well, 
Horse Cave, it's a short list of the things to do there. I guess in one sense, there was nothing to do. In another sense, what I've learned in being the Super 70s guy for the past eight years or so is I was apparently doing all the same stuff that other guys my age were doing, even though we were worlds apart in terms of our upbringing. I, I've said many times that the Super 70s feed is sort of a, an informal high school reunion that we have pretty much on a daily basis because I, I could have never imagined that growing up in the small town of Horse Cave, population 2000, I think one red light in my era, it may be up to two or three now with the uh, the, the growth, the immense growth that Horse Cave has uh, undertaken in the the past decades, but it's a it's a tiny rural Kentucky town with those sensibilities, and I think that to give you a, a hopefully a good answer to that question, I, I think that living in Horse Cave, having a very sheltered life in many respects, I didn't travel. I think when I woke up on my twentieth birthday, I had been to four states in my life. And they were Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, and Indiana. That's how small my world was. You know, my my family, great people, but simple country people. My grandparents wouldn't stray farther on a trip than they could be back home that night. And so that was kind of the world that I grew up in. So I did get a satellite dish. I did read the newspaper every day. I And, and I began to consume all of the culture, I suppose, that I wasn't able to experience firsthand. And many, many, many years later, it turned out to come in useful. Who would have fucking thought it? Yeah. A, a, a beautiful accident, I'm assuming. And I, I've done uh, my research. I've read the articles. And um, I'm, my goal is to not be so repetitive uh, with pretty much every interview you've done where it leads to, OK, how does this happen? But I think for at least from a thumbnail sense, um, I, I, let me ask you in this in this manner, when you look back on the arc of sending that first tweet, whether it was eight to 10 years ago, that then became the Super 70 Sports feed, I want to say I was in on it pretty early, maybe less than 10,000 followers you had. In fact, I was on it so early that you followed me back. I, you can't follow everybody back now because you're up to... 735,000 followers. Um, but when you look back on that arc, what were the moments that you thought, holy shit, this is crazy? Well, there, there were milestones along the way, or at least things that I remember that I consider to be milestones. I, one of the things that strikes me looking back on it now is how simple things were a huge joy at the time. Like I remember reaching a thousand followers and thinking, wow, I've got a thousand followers. That's a lot of people, a thousand people at least care to some small extent about what I might have to say. I was adding about 10 or 12 followers a day back in those days. I remember when I hit 3000 followers, I was in the drive through at a Taco Bell, which you know, there's probably, I, I spend 27% of my life in the drive through of Taco Bell. So it's, it's not that shocking, but I remember thinking 3,000, 3,000 followers. That was probably about eight years ago. And I, I suppose I started to get an inkling when names that I recognized retweeted me or names that I recognized followed me. Uh, you know, where you would have some big name celebrity who was following your account. And it, you know, it was a, it was like a head scratcher at first, like, wow, I can't believe that this person, even in this most superficial, uh, insignificant way, I've crossed paths with them. It, it was pretty wild. And so as that started to happen, I began to realize that I was getting out of my local orbit and at least some people were starting to take notice of this. And by the end of 2015, I had Sports Illustrated named me to some garbage social media online top 100. I think it was the top 100 Twitter accounts. It was the Sports Illustrated Twitter 100. And 
I was pretty shocked to be named even to a list like that because I remember Kobe Bryant was one of them and maybe Serena Williams was one of them, but, you know, big names. And then there's me. And at that point, I had about 20,000 followers. And so I thought, well, I've got 20,000 followers. Sports Illustrated has taken notice. I've got some famous people who are following me. Maybe I'm on to something, but it really has just been a daily grind. I, I began January 1st, 2015. I didn't create the account then, but January 1st, 2015, call it an impromptu New Year's resolution. I woke up and I thought, you know, I created this account some time ago. I haven't done anything with it. Am I going to take this seriously or not? And so I vowed to myself, well, I'll give it a go. And I haven't missed a day since then. You know, I have my Cal Ripken streak going now. And uh, it's just been through working every day. The snowball has built the word of mouth, the retweets, the likes. People have found me. It's been a steady building process. In 2017, I, I had my tweet that I suppose is my most well-known, which was OJ Simpson, Howard Cosell, and then Bruce Jenner. Uh, and I believe it was a Battle of the Network Stars event. And I, I tweeted about that. It went around the world several times, I think, and uh, certainly advanced the name of Super 70 Sports. A couple of years ago, I, I, I uh, had some nice pieces, I guess, actually 2019. A couple of years after the Howard Cosell tweet, I had a couple of nice pieces done on me in the Chicago Tribune and the New York Post. And I think people started to associate my name with the feed uh, a, a little bit more. And from there, it's just been, you know, I always feel like content is king. I have a magnet on my fridge that says proceed as if success is inevitable. And I've always tried to believe in that, even on, even in the times when I was tweeting and was getting not much of a response at all. And I look back on it now and I see tweets in the very early days that there are some out there still preserved in their original form with no retweets and no likes. I found one from 2014, stumbled upon it uh, not long ago, and I almost tweeted it. And then I thought, no, it's better. It's kind of perfect the way that it is alone yeah. in the wilderness, because in the early days, who the fuck was I tweeting to? I look back on it. These now, are like rookie cards. They're like rookie cards. And I look back on those. Yeah, if I could, if I could, I think the NFT uh, is, is the NFT boom already over. Did I think you could probably uh, like screen cap it or do something and then sell it and or, and or delete it and then sell it. Yeah. And then you'd I, have an original that can't be once you delete it, it, it has lost its ability to be retweeted or liked. Yeah, you're the only person you you're the only person who is engaged with this tweet by than, giving me money for it. Yeah, by giving me money for it. So it's all about capitalism at the yeah. end of the day, Tim. We know whatever the artistic, uh, you, you you know, achievements are at, at the end of the day, you you want to make sure that it's worth it to you to do it. But in the early days, I was purely doing it as a hobby, and I look back on it now, honestly eight, nine years later, and I wonder why I kept doing it. I, I I don't know why I didn't get up one day. It was just like, well, fuck this. I'm I'm not going to send out a tweet about Jack Lambert that two people are going to see. But it's why fun though, I, right? I and you and when you did get the payoff, there's probably a almost a, a narcotizing effect to it. No, 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 no not narcotizing. I don't want to say that because that that'd be the opposite. That's where you just kind of get, uh, you know, turn into a zombie. Uh, there's a, there's a thrill of, of chasing the one that does hit. Yeah. I guess maybe like a golfer, you know, you just, uh, you, you forget all the bad ones. Uh, and then when you have that one sweet swing that, uh, places the ball right in the middle of the fairway, uh, that's the one you keep chasing and dealing with all yeah. the other ones. That's a pretty good way of looking at it because there, there certainly is great satisfaction when you, when you tweet something out and it takes off. It is like flushing. I don't know what it's like to flush a drive 350 yards, but it's got to be the same type of feeling or connecting with a baseball perfectly and, you know, hitting it into the second or third deck. 
it, it is that sort of a rush when you really, really kill one or when something really cool happens. I, I, I nowadays with the amount of followers that I have, every day is sort of like hunting for Easter eggs. You know, you went, you end up getting a DM or a nice comment or a retweet from somebody that maybe you're, you're a fan of and that you've never engaged with before. Or somebody sends you a message and says, Hey, are you aware that Tom Brady just retweeted you? Oh shit. He did. That's cool. And, you know, and then you go and look sure enough. Oh, Ric Flair retweeted me today with a whoo, you know, and it's like, okay, that's pretty fucking cool. You can't deposit it into the bank. But man, it is a lot of fun when stuff like that happens. So, but it's, so it's easier now. Uh, the early days is that's what I can't relate to. I, I I look at it now from the standpoint of somebody that has a pretty substantial audience, and I'm I'm grateful that the guy who had 500 followers, a thousand followers, 1,500 followers. I want to go back and thank that guy for keeping going and believing in this because that. Of everything that I've done, the thing that I'm proudest of is that I just stuck with it because I am at a point now where some really cool things are happening for my brand and for me personally. And none of those things would have happened if I hadn't been willing to grind and grind and grind those first four or five, six years. And so the if, if I've learned anything about this in my midlife, it, it's that hard work actually really does pay off. And I hope that my kids are are watching what has happened to me because they 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 know me as their idiot father rather than the super 70s guy. And so if if their dad can carve something out that's kind of special, I hope that they see from that that their own hard work is is uh has a great chance of being rewarded too if they believe something and stick with it. Now of course I don't want to say of course, but I think it makes sense that uh, helping the brand along the way is that it was called Super 70 Sports and people knew at least loosely what to follow. I know that you have people doing the neener neener uh, that didn't take place in the 70s and that totally defeats the spirit of, uh, you know, the the fun and uh, there is you can get into and do whatever you want. It's not just relegated to the 70s. Yeah, I but, think, I but think you're not Ricky Cobb brand as much as it is anything. It's an attitude. It's a frame of mind. Yes. But but the fact that it's at seven Super 70 Sports and not at Ricky Cobb, um, do you ever wish that it had been? Because here I want more credit for all this stuff <laughs> that I'm doing. Uh, this isn't a business. There aren't five writers, uh, you know, bouncing ideas off each other in a writer's room. Uh, I'm the one accumulating this and, uh, I want people to know that I'm Ricky Cobb and I'm doing this. I definitely got to a point. It, it, there's a progression, right? At first, you're just grateful that you're being noticed. You're surprised that you're being noticed. It's cool that you're being noticed. Oh my God, people are noticing this. So in the beginning, you're just shocked that anybody gives a shit and it feels good as time goes on and you you do it a little longer, the old ego starts to talk a little bit to you. And it's like, well, I do have a name and, and, and you're right. I, I, I have gotten so many times. I love you guys. You guys are great. You guys crack me up. And it's a great compliment in one sense, because they're assuming that it's more than one person who's churning out this content. But on the other hand, from an ego perspective, I started to think to myself, I'm not a team of people. I'm one guy and I want a little more credit for it. Right. And, as and it should be noted because I didn't mention this, Ricky. So for the people listening, Ricky is not a trained comedian. This isn't somebody who just came up with a, a shtick. Uh, well, maybe you did, but anyways, you know, Ricky is a community college sociology professor in suburban Chicago. Uh, so I just want to put that out there for anybody listening, that this is not uh, anybody who was working on his comedic chops in the clubs uh, or writing uh, blogs uh, or whatever. I mean, this is this is there's a lot of natural. And uh, un, un, there's a lot of raw uh, potential that came to the fore here and became something. And you should get credit for that because hell, you could just be teaching community college and, and minding your own business. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of over that now. I think for the most part, people have caught on to who I am. And I feel like I'm sure there's some people that don't know, but there are many who do know now. And I don't feel like I'm unrecognized anymore. But I but I went through a phase where when it was kind of in the evolution process that it's gone through to get where it is now. And hopefully that evolution continues and there's bigger and better to come from here. I'm certainly invested in making that happen. But there, there was a while where I felt like the brand name was, it was too far ahead of my own name. And I'm not an egomaniac, but when you do spend as much time as I spend trying to entertain people, at a certain point, if you're doing it at a pretty good level, and I think that I am, you'd like to be recognized for it. I think it's just human human nature. But uh, but yeah, I kind of came out of nowhere. I'm, I'm I'm the Roy Hobbs of comedy. Who who are you? You know, Chad, Chad Lowe, a friend of mine, um, who we became friends through this. Chad was one of my early celebrity followers. That's and, a hell of a thing to be able to say. Chad Lowe is a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah. You know, for, so, especially- from the seventies, you know, yeah, yeah, or the eighties. You know, yeah. Yeah. He's a, you know, we're, we're buddies and, 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 I'm, and he's been on my po- old podcast. His brother, Rob is a follower and a fan and Rob has been on my podcast. And, uh, but you know, Chad, one time he likened me, he said, it's like, he's like, I just wanted to know who the fuck you were. He, he said, it was like going down. It's like seeing a light on in the gymnasium and going into the gym at midnight and the janitors just draining threes and you're like, who, who is this guy? (laughs) And so I was kind of flattered by that because I, you know, I think for a lot of people who it's Matt Damon and goodwill hunting. Yeah. It's a little bit, who's who's this janitor filling out this formula? Yeah. Without the IQ, if the janitor had been funny, maybe that's kind of who I, who (laughs) I am. And so, um, so that was flattering, but Obviously, I've got 20 years in the classroom. It's it's a pretty decent proxy for stand up when you're doing two, three hours a day in the classroom and you got a room full of predominantly 18 to 25 year olds and they're not there to laugh. They're not necessarily always there to pay attention. And so I have found through the years, you know, it's my nature. If you put me in a room with anybody for 75 minutes, I'm going to crack some jokes. I can't fucking help it. You put me in front of 30 students for 75 minutes, it's inevitable that I'm going to say some stuff looking for, for a reaction. And I learned early on that it it helps with learning because if you can every five, you know, 10, 15 minutes, if you can interject something that evokes a reaction, you kind of bring everybody back with you a little bit. The folks who are drifting Suddenly you've got them back now because they're chuckling. And now maybe they're going to listen to the sociology that I've got for the next five or 10 minutes. And then I'll drop something else in, in order to try to keep it engaging. And so, um, you know, as far as stand up goes, I, it's something that I want to do. I, I'm definitely going to do it. And it, while I have all the respect in the world for stand up comics, I think for somebody who has never done stand up, Twitter is virtual standup, at least the way that I do it. The reaction is immediate. You know whether you got the laugh or you didn't get the laugh within, I can tell you, generally speaking, I can tell you within 60 seconds if a tweet is going to be really good, okay, maybe I'm going to pull it back. I can tell you with certainty within three or four minutes. So it doesn't take very long. You get that reaction. The sample size is big enough in the first few minutes that you can extrapolate out what it's going to do usually with pretty good accuracy, especially considering I do it 30, 35 times a day. I just know it like the back of my hand. And I've got a lot of hours logged being in front of a classroom, talking to students. So I think stand up with all due respect to what an art that is and the difficulty that goes into it. I think I'm pretty well positioned, uh, uniquely positioned probably to, to go and do that. But it's been hard, Tim, to even label myself. Do I call myself a comedian? I, I, I do appearances on podcasts, television, radio. Lots of times people don't know how to introduce me because, well, you're the Twitter guy. You're a, are you a comic? Are you, are, are you, what is a comedian? A comedian is somebody who makes you laugh. So, you know, at the end of the day, if I make what you What about laugh, humorist? 
because yeah. it combines the sociological aspect yeah. of it. It's obser it's observational uh, and you're making people laugh, but that seems to be a little too sophisticated and, and not in, right. uh, in a complimentary way. I think you are a comedian. Yeah. I, I prefer, I like, think, but maybe, well, I don't know. you know, we were talking before we started taping this and you were saying, I refer to myself as a teacher rather than a professor. I'm like, no, I'm a professor. I just call myself a teacher because I go into a classroom and I try to teach people. I don't go into a classroom and try to profess. I'm going into the classroom. I'm trying to teach. I'm trying to make people laugh. I'm a very, I'm a very low falutin guy. You know, I'm not, and you're right. When you say humorist, I'm thinking of Mark Twain or some motherfucker who's doing a heady piece for the New Yorker that, you know, sophisticated people will get a chuckle from. I'm, I'm a man of the people. I'd like to think that my comedy, some of it is functioning on a, a higher level than just being the easiest low hanging fruit comedy. I aspire to do smart comedy, but I also hope that it's accessible, but yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm a comedian. Call me a humorist, whatever. It, I suppose at the end of the day, it doesn't matter as long as people are interested in what I have to say and are being entertained by it. The phrase sweet bastard, uh, <laughs> it has become the quintessential super 70 sports phrase. Um, maybe we can get into uh, the nuance of it. Uh, do you have to use it once a day? For instance, do you have a quota that you like? Uh, do you have a signature, uh, you know, a signature, um, uh, uh, process, you know, with using it, but how did that become the phrase and did it because it tracked, is it something that you used in your life? Uh, what did, because it kept coming back to you? I mean, what, what made you, how did sweet bastard become what it is? Well, sweet bastard goes back to my, one of my colleagues at my college, former colleague at my college and a good friend of mine who came into the office one day and he told me that the White Sox were having a Harold Baines bobblehead day. This is probably like 2013 or something. And he and I used to go to ball games today. Shout shout out to my my buddy. His name is Jeremy Shermack. If he's if he's listening to this, um, he came in one day and he stuck his phone in my face. And it was the Harold Baines bobblehead that the White Sox were going to be giving away in a couple of weeks or whatever it was. And he said, look at this sweet bastard. And it was one of those things where just wasn't thinking about Twitter, wasn't thinking about anything, but it was just the way that that sounded. I liked it. There was something about it. It just, I liked it. I kind of took it and put it in my back pocket and I dropped it into a tweet. One day, I don't even remember the first time that I used it on Twitter. I don't remember uh, having a strategy. I certainly didn't have a strategy that like, I'm going to create a catchphrase and make this a thing. That was all very organic. But um, it, it was just a phrase that a friend dropped one day casually. And I just thought, I really, really like that. I started to incorporate it. It, it, you know, into my vernacular, people liked it and it became the, you know, one of the things I guess that I'm most closely associated with, which is, which is kind of cool. How many people have a catchphrase? So it, it, it's pretty cool. I think that uh, Harold Baines, when he's on the autograph circuit should, and they, and they charge for inscriptions for all these things, but you charge, he's going to charge for it. But it should be Harold Baines, the original sweet bastard, should be a yeah. coveted uh, collectible. The the Harold Baines bobblehead, the the inspiration of it. Yeah, he he is the original sweet bastard. Harold Harold doesn't even know that he's in the Hall of Fame, and and he thinks mistakenly that that's his greatest achievement, and yet it's number two. So somebody needs to tell Harold that he's the original sweet bastard. And, uh, you know, because I want him to be able to take that victory lap for the rest of his life. I don't think that Harold deserves to be in the hall of fame personally. Therefore I will say that being the original sweet bastard is his career achievement. Yeah. Uh, we, because can the can rest is not deserved. A, can we make this like a drug deal? 
Like I'll give him sweet bastard. If he'll take his plaque off the wall and walk it home. Cause God bless him. You know, it's like, I don't like to be the guy who shits on people that I disagree with them being in the hall of fame because it's not his fault. He no. was a, he was a terrific player for many years Seems like a good guy to the extent that I see him on television here in Chicago once in a while. Don't have anything bad to say about Harold Baines. However, but when watching him play, I however, never once thought, now there's a Hall of Famer. Never once in your life did you think that. Less deserving than Dale Murphy and Dave Parker off the top of my head, who were MVP caliber players, who, you know, yes. Murph won two and – Parker won one, and Parker was an unbelievable uh, right fielder in addition to being a great hitter. So Harold got in because Tony Larusa was a good politician for him. Uh, but uh, so yeah, I, I guess you're right. At the end of the day, the uh, the sweet bastardry is is it should be the number one thing on his resume. Has this been discussed before? I mean, I, the the origin of sweet bastard. I'm sure has been, but the idea that Harold Baines, I mean, should this be a campaign um, <laughs> now that Harold Baines as the original sweet bastard, you guys need to get together in some way, uh podcast, uh, something, maybe I'll even reach out and see if he's, what would, would that, would you be open to that? It should happen. It really should happen. And Harold, okay. Harold's just going to be like, what the, who, the, who, what? I'm, I'm maybe a, he's a big I'm fan what? and he doesn't even know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Harold and I could, you know, it could be like a whole buddy thing. There could be a montage of Harold and I, you know, just doing stuff together and taking a walk. Although we've together. we've Probably. now both gone on the record as saying he doesn't belong in the hall of fame. I don't know <laughs> that he's necessarily yeah. going to jump at the chance to uh, join us. You were a very one dimensional player. Do you want to be my best friend? Right. You yeah. didn't even have a glove for 12 of your uh, years in the major leagues. Uh, you didn't have a glove and you weren't even driving in a hundred runs most of those years that your only job was to do that. And yet, how does it feel to be in the hall of fame? Again, I don't want to shit on Harold Baines. He's nor should we, head, nor though, it was a really, really sweet looking bobblehead though. That bobblehead is a sweet bastard. And the, sad, a sweet part bastard. About it is, the sad part about it is, is that I, I didn't go to the game and I don't have the bobblehead. Probably. I, I probably should at least go on eBay and fork over 20 or 25 bucks before people find out that it's the Genesis and the price skyrockets. I need to corner the market on these bobbleheads and then just come grab back this podcast them. will uh, reach yeah. dozens of people. Uh, <laughs> so uh, make sure that you act um, quickly. And when I say that in relative terms, uh, by sometime uh, uh, mid April. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. It's amazing that you're doing this quite frankly. <laughs> um, are there rules to sweet bastard so that way it doesn't get overused or are there are only are things that you will not use sweet bastard to describe i'm flying by the seat of my pants with these tweets i get up i always tell people i get up every day i don't have a fucking plan i don't know what i'm going to tweet when i get up 90 percent of days if I have some, if I know that I'm going to be on the road or I'm going to be flying somewhere the next day and I'm going to be busy, I'll try to load tweets into my draft folder the night before so that I can kind of just send them on the fly rather than actually be grinding over trying to write something while I'm. People have to be sending you photos and things that, right? Like the picture, like the catalog stuff for me. I was a huge, one of the best days of the year for me is when the Sears Christmas catalog oh. got delivered whenever that was probably in October, September or October. And I would wear that sweet bastard out. Yeah, you would. Uh, or the pennies catalog. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, just going through it. So when those are some of my favorites when you do, because nobody's ever th in the lunch boxes also, I mean, there's a bunch of you, you have, yeah. you have subsets that are, that are amazing. Well, to, but you know, I'm guessing people are. Do you have a? Do you have a suppliers? I guess I should say of. There, there. I material. definitely have some folks that uh, keep content coming my way, and there's there's never enough. So if, if anyone who is listening to this who thinks, well, I could come up with some stuff for him, the email is is in the header of the Twitter feed. 
I'm accepting everything. Worst case scenario, I can't use it. Best case scenario, I can use it. The, the toughest part of this is finding stuff that's worth tweeting. If you give me something that's pretty good, I've been sharpening what I do long enough that I'm going to find the joke in it. Uh, but at this point too, also, right, you've got approaching three quarters of a million followers. I feel like the pressure is greater now than it's ever been to make sure that what I tweet is at a certain bar. I think people have come to expect that. And I don't want to coast now because I work so hard to get this audience. You want to make sure that you keep delivering what it is that they expect. So if I held myself to a lower standard comedy wise, this would be a lot easier, but I kind of have a level in my own mind of what a tweet's going to do before I'll, before I'm willing to click send on it. And sometimes I'm wrong. Sometimes they, I, I'll think that a tweet is above the bar and my audience will tell me, no, actually it, that one was not quite it. And, and so I get that feedback. It's able, you know, I'm easily able to tweak and modify and workshop stuff. And there are some tweets that I have that it may have taken tweeting the same thing three or four times, just kind of adjusting the caption before I found, you know, what was really the great stuff. Because one thing like talking about stand up comics, which we were earlier, at least before we started taping this. One advantage that a stand-up comic has that I don't have is that they can walk into some dingy little club in front of eight or 10 or 12 or 20 people and they can work on their shit and find out what resonates and what doesn't, tweak that, keep building it. And then if they're the kind of comic that's big enough that they're going out on the road or if they're really a big comic and they're going out and filling theaters and arenas, before they go do that, they've already worked you know in spring training essentially to get their material where they want it before they're ready to take it into regular season games everything i send out is a regular season game i can't send something out to a three thousand person focus group sub audience before i send it out to everybody so when i click send you know i'm many times the things that i send out i thought of it 17 seconds before I hit send. And that's the kind of thing that could be sort of intimidating and daunting if you allowed it to be. But I try not to think about that. Not I'm not thinking about the fact that like, you know, every time you hit send, especially in the in this modern age where people are so hyper offended by this and that and the other, you know, whenever you type anything and you hit send on it and you're sending it out to as many people as there are who are consuming my material, it's a fairly big decision, but it's a decision that I make so often that I, I've gotten so used to it. I don't look at it that way, but I, I, I do in a sense envy the fact that a stand up can figure out what's, what works and what doesn't work before they put it on full blast for everybody. Right. Social media validation is one thing, but, and maybe if you can explain to me how this happens, but when Jimmy Kimmel reaches out to you, about a television show based on your Twitter feed, which is you, when you say your Twitter feed, that's not just some, you know, again, it's not an enterprise or it's not a business, although it, it, it is, but there's no, there's no employees. You're not putting out 1099s and, and W2s. Uh, it is you. Uh, and uh, when Jimmy Kimmel reaches out and is essentially, even the idea that he's considering a television show based off of your Twitter feed. Uh, can you, can you describe what that sense of validation felt like? Well, Tim, I will tell you, my daughter got a 1099 this year, which is pretty exciting. We're at, we're at the level. She's the official super 70 sports customer service liaison. So did uh, my co-host Jonah Bronstein, who's not here, uh, so but uh, he I'm also at, got 1099. I'm at a one, I'm at a one 1099 issuance level of success right now. And I'm excited about it. Uh, as far That's, as the, I, I feel great to have something in common. <laughs> there you Cow. go. See, we're climbing together, brother. Um, the, the Kimmel thing obviously has been a huge game changer for me and I'm extremely grateful 
to Jimmy because he's in a position where he's at a level where his interest and his willingness to back what I do in a television venture is something that he by no means had to do. And it's, uh, you know, a, it's validating when somebody who is a, let's face it, he's, he's one of the icons of late night TV. Now he's been at it for 20 years. He's, um, he, he's on that level where you've got to start putting him into that conversation. When you talk about Carson and Letterman and Conan and Kimmel and, because how many people have been able to sustain that for the length of time that he has? And so I have an immense amount of respect for Jimmy. And he's a hell of an idol, I've, I've come to realize. But the initial reach out was just a quick Twitter DM that he sent me saying that I think your stuff is, is very funny. And you, you do a double take. And you look at it and you're like, okay, well, wait a minute. Well, there's the, there's the blue check. That's... That's actually him sent him back a quick little response that just basically said, coming from you, that means a great deal to me. It's a not very nice compliment. Thank you. And the main thing you take away from it is, is that, you know, if somebody like that has noticed my work, it must mean I'm doing something right. So it certainly gives you a charge. I probably didn't need to motivate myself to get up and tweet the next day. Um, about a month later, something like that, he had the president of his production company, Camelot, a guy named another great guy named Scott Lonker, reached out to me and just said, hey, basically just, you know, Jimmy likes what you do. It, maybe it would be worth exploring. Would you have interest in just having a discussion about if there's something here? And so I certainly was interested. You know, what was I going to say? No, I'm I'm preparing a syllabus. Of course, I, of course I'm interested. Please, twist in my arm. Um, and so that became a, a series of creative discussions and things that eventually led us to the Super Maximum Retro Show, which uh, debuted on Vice uh, TV uh, March the 7th. So we've been at that now for, for about just a little over two weeks. I was at the premiere party for that in New York City uh, back on March the 7th. And it's it's crazy stuff. It's, it's very, very crazy stuff. But I think that, you know, when you're in the position I'm in, you, uh, it's only natural at a certain point as you reach 100,000 followers, 200,000 followers, 300, whatever, where you're thinking, okay, well, what, am I going to get a break? Who's, you know, is there going to be somebody? Because you're in that position where you need somebody to go to bat for you. Where's the pivot, as they call exactly. it? Exactly. Where's the pivot? Where's that going to come from? And that comes back to that magnet on my fridge, which is still there. Proceed as if success is inevitable, because there were many days that I questioned it, that that I doubted it, that you started to wonder, is it ever going to happen? Is this just some, is this just like an ego thing where nothing's going to come of it other than some people think you're funny and you're just investing a ton of time into this, and maybe, maybe you're not going to get a payoff for everything that you invested. So you kind of just have to keep the faith, keep grinding, keep believing in it. And, but, but certainly, even before anything about a potential television project was mentioned, just the fact that a guy at that level took the time to reach out to, to an anonymous person and just say like, hey, you're doing something right, meant the, wor meant the world to me. And, 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 and Jimmy and I have since uh, had some communications about this. And he's, you know, he's been, he's just been so kind because I think one thing about it is, is for a lot of people that, you know, when you, when you see them getting to the point of where things are starting to happen for them, it's like, it seems like it's an overnight sudden thing, but you know, for a guy like Jimmy, he worked in radio for years, putting in the time, refining his skills day after day after day, working on being better at, at what he did and doing it with no guarantees or assurances that things were ever going to break for him, you know? So to Jimmy's credit, I think he's a guy that remembers where he came from. And I think that you know, maybe he saw in, in a, in a, I don't want to speak for him, but maybe in a small way, he saw a little bit of himself in 
the grind of what I was doing day after day after day. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll always be grateful to Jimmy for reaching out to me because um, it, it certainly leveled this thing up uh, well beyond where I thought I would be at this point. How has the television experience been for you in terms of not only being on camera, but uh, being involved in production? Uh, it, it was, it's been an education uh, for sure. Uh, that was my first time being involved in a television production when we taped season one. And I'm, I'm walking into an environment that it, it, a st really strange, a little bit of a mind fuck in some respects, because you're, you're walking into a situation that literally would not be occurring without you. I'm walking onto a TV production set with all kinds of stuff, incredible set work that was done. So many talented people working on this, both in front of the camera and behind the scenes. And you think to yourself, wow, this would not be happening if I hadn't started a Twitter account. Now, at the same time, you're also dealing with all the thoughts of, of everybody here. I probably have less television experience than any of them. And so you're kind of there looking around, trying to figure out how it works, trying not to make an idiot of yourself, but also trying to absorb how does the sausage get made? I was real curious. I was asking questions. It was fun for me to go into the truck and sit in there with Ryan Ling, who's our uh, showrunner, and to be in there kind of seeing, you know, what that end of it looks like with all the monitors up in front of me. And then to sit in the studio and watch episodes get taped almost as though I were, I were just an audience member. And then to be on three of the episodes, obviously, to be in front of the camera, that's a whole different experience. And so when I when I got there, the, the plan was for me to appear on one episode. There were 10 season one episodes uh, that are going to air. I think that, five, I believe five have aired so far. We've got five more original first runs. That, I've seen that, four. They're very enjoyable. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um so I got there, I was supposed to tape the first one and I go back to the trailer afterwards and uh, Scott Lonker, president of Camelot comes up, knocks on the door and says, can you step outside for a minute? And, and so I do. And he says, how would you feel about doing another one? And I said, you know, again, same thing. You don't have to ask me twice. I absolutely, I would love to do another one because not only was it fun, I enjoyed it but I felt that I had something to contribute. I've always said from the beginning, I just want the show to be successful, whether that means I'm on it, whether that means I'm not on it. If the show is good, people like it and we get to keep making it. it it's not about me as far as any of that goes, but it was, it was a surprise when he said, Hey, how would you feel about doing another one? You know, Chris Stefano, the host, who is a very funny guy, I think was happy with my performance on the first one. And so they thought, well, Maybe we'll put the bat in your hands again. So I did another one. And then on the last day of taping, uh, one of the uh, execs over at Vice TV, a wonderful guy named Pete Gaffney, um, he and I were having a conversation on the last day of taping. And he said, well, how would you feel about doing another one? And so I, I got in and taped a third one. And I, I got increasingly comfortable with each time that I did it as I was kind of figuring out okay, this is it. All right. Maybe I'm not completely a fish out of water. Maybe I could get comfortable in this environment pretty quickly. So I walked out of there, even though I was only, I think all of the shooting took place over maybe eight days. I was there for like the last five of the eight days. Uh, but by the time I left, I felt like I had really gotten a, a, a crash course in how these things are done. And so very, very excited to have a chance to go back for season two and walk in on day one, knowing the things that I learned from the last experience. But man, being on television, that is a very, very strange thing. And for your kids, it's a strange thing too, because, you know, that's their dad up there. And so I'll watch the episodes with my daughters and they get a kick out of it. And I think- How old are they? Having a dad who's on TV, that's credibility that you can take to middle school with you. You know, uh, my uh, my kids are 10, 12, 14, 17 and 20. 
All girls. How's this ride? That's got to be a crazy ride for them, right? Especially for your 20 year old. Yeah, pretty crazy. Well, you know, it became it became uh, a, a job for her yeah, because she she does independently contract for me and is and is a big help. So it's it's nice that she's been able to be involved on that level. And for my younger kids, they're super excited about it. And there are other projects in the works. Other things are going on that I can't. I'm not really at liberty to talk about right now, but. There's other interesting things that are kind of happening in the background. So the kids are the kids are pretty excited. Dad's job is more exciting now than it was when I was just talking about theories and uh, social norms and all that. Or even stuff. when you're you know you're you're at your computer and the kids need to do something like I don't know eat, uh, eat <laughs> dinner and you're like uh, give me a, give me five minutes I have to tweet. Oh yeah. It's always, it's always, at my, it's my phone. And a look, anybody who is good friends with me will tell you I am, my phone is basically, it's, it's an appendage at this point. And it, and it's true. I have a, I have a weird, I kind of have a weird life because I've created this beast and the beast has to be fed every, I don't know, half an hour to two hours pretty much from the time I get up until the time I go to bed and I don't schedule tweets. Uh, it's just not my thing. So anytime I'm sending a tweet, I'm sending, uh, I'm sending that tweet. It may have been sitting in my draft folder. I may have only had to open the draft folder and take two seconds to send it, but um, I'm sending that tweet in real time. And so it's a hell of a lot of work. Sometimes I ask myself, what the fuck have I, you know, what the fuck have I done? There are no days off. I can't go on a camping trip because I can't be off the grid. This has been a thing, you know, uh, where it's been said to me, you know, do you want to go camping? And I'm like, I can't it, camping. Where are we going to be? What do they call it? Glamping. Is that what modern people do where they try to pretend they're camping, but they take all their modern conveniences with but them? But why can't you schedule? You can schedule tweets. You can schedule tweets, but man, I just, I, I, I don't like to schedule tweets. And I, a, a few years ago, you know, I, I, I go, dealt with some shit with like uh, uh, account security. I got hacked in 2020. And so I am like, I, tr I treat all of the access to the account. I actually, actually to the point that a friend of mine said, you know, you really need to leave the information about super seventies in your will or something, because if you get hit by a Greyhound bus, right. You know, you have a large enough audience that it could still continue in some fashion and your children could potentially benefit from that. So, you know, maybe, maybe leave behind the, the keys of how to keep this thing going. The nuclear for, football. Yeah. Like the nuclear football, but I, you know, I'm very protective of that. And, um, and, and plus I just prefer, I prefer to do it that way. Uh, just something about the rhythm of my day is so intimately connected to the Twitter account now that, uh, just having them scheduled to be deployed at a particular time. I, it, it, it even when I used to do that, it never felt right. What are your thoughts? And if you don't feel like answering, or maybe it's too dicey by all means, uh, uh no offense. What are your thoughts on the developments of the past few months regarding Twitter? I mean, this is your home in, in many ways. It's your business's home anyway. Um, well, philosophically, what are your thoughts on it? Well, you know, for me, um, first of all, what's good for Twitter is good for me. Um, and, you know, certainly there were a lot of people that were very concerned about um Elon Musk purchasing Twitter. I wasn't one of them. I was rooting for him. I personally, and I, and I, I stay apolitical and I try to be as apolitical as I possibly can. But I, I will say that the modern day cancel culture vibe, everybody is so outraged about the wrong turn of a phrase. And look, don't get me wrong. There are some things that absolutely merit people being outraged about them. But I do think that the pendulum has swung so far now where 
there's just sort of like an outrage industry in our society where there are some people that are just waiting for something they can seize upon to be aggrieved about or whatever. And as a comic, and particularly as a, and, and I think any comic, at least any comic that I'm interested in for the most part has an element of edge to them. Uh, you know, all the people that I most respect, my favorite comics, Dave Chappelle, Bill Burr, George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Louis C.K. Those are off the top of my head, five of my favorites. Eddie Murphy back in the day. Go Piscopo. Uh, <laughs> well, let's not go crazy. But uh, but those comics, right, They they there's some envelope pushing. You know, I like to get near the line sometimes because... Otherwise, you're just doing Jay Leno's stand-up act uh, on the Tonight Show monologue, you know, and that's okay, but it's so safe. And so sometimes you want to push it a little bit, you know, anybody who's a comedian anyways is a mischief maker at heart, probably. And so I, and so I did not like the, what I felt was pushing towards hyper censorship in some cases. And I, and so I was actually in favor of Elon purchasing Twitter. And of course, there's been a whole lot of skies falling type stuff. Uh, you know, back in November, people were writing Twitter's obituary. Uh, I had people sending me messages in November telling me that, you know, in some cases, looking back on it now, it was, it's kind of funny, but people sending me messages saying, hey, you know, if, Here's here's my phone number so we can stay in touch when there's no Twitter anymore. And I <laughs> tweeted at the time. I said, look, I said, Elon Musk sends people into outer fucking space. I'm pretty sure he can keep an app running, regardless of what you think of the guy or what, you know, what anybody's political beliefs are. If, if, if you know, he, he's sending shit into space, surely we can keep Twitter up and. Thankfully, um, you know, it seems to me that uh, while people can have their opinions about, you know, what they think he's doing strategically with this or with that, the the app to me, which I spend so much of my life on it, the app to me seems like it's just as good or better than it's ever been in terms of its performance. So what's good for Twitter is good for me. I root number one, whether whether it was whoever owned it before i don't know jack i think jack dorsey was it wasn't he was he already gone at that point uh whoever owns it if elon sells it tomorrow to somebody else i'm going to be a fan of that person because i'm it's sort of like the it's sort of like the old patriotic americans who used to say that well i didn't vote for this president but but that's my president right we've lost that as a society but uh, that's kind of how I feel about Twitter. Whoever is running Twitter, whether it's Elon Musk or whether it's somebody else, they're going to have my support because what's good, a healthy Twitter is obviously what I need in order to do what I do. Was that good answer? Question. Was that a political? It, oh, it does. Answer? I think that, no, it's it's about business. It's you know, business. As, uh, I need as Twitter. As Even Johnson once famously said, it's a profit deal. Yeah. I mean, it's, I need, that's my forum. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, multitasking. And if I had known that I was going to build this kind of audience, well, maybe I would have been cross-posting on Facebook from day one, or I would have been cross-posting to Instagram from day one. I didn't do that. So, you know, my eggs are in the Twitter basket. So, you know, I'm a fan of Twitter. And it seems to me to this point, regardless of what the detractors may say, it seems to me that overall Elon Musk has done a nice job so far. So credit to him. And I, I, I hope that the health of Twitter continues to look as good as it looks today. You've been very gracious with your time. And I know that you are constantly thinking, how much longer can this go on? And I promise I'm wrapping it up. Uh, but I just want to, I guess it's a point to make slash question. Uh, the host of your show, a Super Maximum Retro Show, uh, Chris DiStefano, uh, is he any relation to Benny DiStefano? It's spelled the same way. Have you asked him this? And what is happening with two different pronunciations of the same last name? I I, I am not aware. I, uh, Benny Di Stefano, a great Pittsburgh Pirates, pitcher. the last left-handed catcher in Major League Baseball. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that he wasn't a catcher by trade, but he caught on occasion, and he was a lefty. Yeah. 
So I, 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 I need like, to know. I feel like Di Stefano is a little sexier as the pronunciation. I agree. You know, I agree. That's I, and that's the point I was going to make is when Chris says his last name, or when I don't recall actually if he says it or if a narrator on the show, uh, however he's introduced when the show begins, I don't like it. <laughs> because I want Di Stefano. I know I know it's spelled the same way. Yeah. And uh Benny it's, Di Stefano. It's like Joe Theisman. He was Theisman or Theisman, that's right. Right. He was he, he, he was what was he? He was Theisman. Joe Thies, he was Joe Theisman. Yeah. He was Joe Theisman. And then they tried to run his Heisman trophy campaign. And I mean, where where would he be if he wasn't Joe Theisman? Joe Theisman would have he would have stayed in the CFL. He would, yes, have, never he would have remained an Argonaut. Yeah, he would have remained an Argonaut. He would have never been the NFL MVP. So uh, I'll have to talk to Chris about that. We'll try to get him to step it up for season two. I'll have a heart to heart with him about Benny and the advantages of being a Di Stefano. All right. If you'll allow me, I have some rapid fire either ors. They're a bit abstract, so they will require some thought, but they are gen I think you'll understand where I'm getting with them. So they're not apt. There's some we are comparing in some cases apples and oranges. But hey, sometimes you open the fridge or you look in the fruit bowl and you have to pick an apple or an orange. All right. So based on what we just spoke about, so I'm calling an audible. I'm gonna make this my first either or. Um rated rookie. Or blue check mark. <laughs> well, the blue check mark, you know, now it's just like you got to pay for it. So now I will tell you the the old blue check mark where it was like a big swing and dick. If you had one, yes, it was. It was it was a moment when I got my blue check mark because I didn't get it until I was like over four hundred thousand followers. I went through, we talked about like, how did I feel about my name being behind the brand and sort of people assuming that I'm a staff of writers. That was actually less frustrating to me than the, not having the blue check. There was a, I'll never forget. I complained about the blue check uh, a few times. Periodically, I would tweet, you know, what are you, what do you got to fucking do to get a blue check around here? And I had a guy who tweeted me back and said, sucks to be you. And I clicked on his account. Ah. He was a meteorologist ah. from either South Dakota, I think it was South Dakota, but it was it was something like that. And he and he had 90 followers ah. and a blue check. And I was just like, you motherfucker. Because his station had like everybody who worked for the station yeah. probably had the blue check. I gained more followers in the last like 12 minutes than he had in his life. And he had a blue check and I had shit. So I'm going to have to say as much as great as being a rated rookie is, I'm going to tell you something. The rated rookie still means so much to me that I feel like I've tweeted this before. I feel like Steve Jeltz, Steve Jeltz is like 60 years old now, but I feel like, well, maybe he could still emerge at some the point. The worst baseball player of all time. Yeah, he he did nothing. Rookie. Yeah. He, he couldn't hit. He couldn't even a lot, a lot of hey, times you look at that and be hey. like, well, he could steal 25 bases. No, he was Sir. slow too, and he couldn't feel on top Sir. of it. He had some sweet Jerry curls. Yes, he did. I mean, his Jerry yes, curls he were, did. see the thing that he had going is he looked kind of like Juan Samuel. And yeah. they, and they and they were playing, you know, the up the middle. So there were a lot of us that were just like, well, motherfucker, you look like Juan Samuel, play like Juan Samuel. Right. Go steal and, 75 bases. And wasn't happening. No, you, you got to get on base 75 times. That was the problem. Do we have an answer then? Is it rated? Or is it, was... It's pre Elon era. It was the blue check. All right. So it's a, it's a variable. But now if you can, but now if you can just buy the blue check, I guess the rated True. rookie, because it's, bestowed. but we're all about to lose our blue checks. Well, the, the blue, the, yeah, it's, it's passed. If you're a legacy blue check, you're going to lose your blue check. I, Hey, look, I told you, I'm an Elon fan. I went ahead and played ball. So I, I've, I have updated. I am a, I am Twitter blue. I have, oh, you the, are. I have the ability to edit tweets. Now people have complained about, we can't, oh, tweets, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I can bring myself to pay for it. You can, you can pull I'm it. I'm going to be like that meteorologist in, uh, in Sioux city. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I figure again, it's like, it's one of those deals where, 
you know, I don't know if uh, charity being what it is. Occasionally, you know, I'll, I'll make charitable donations to places that I feel uh, are, are doing good work. And in this case, I figure, hey, look, if uh, if my subscription money can be used to improve Twitter, then I'm investing in myself. That's what I that's what I tell myself anyway. All right, we got ten more of these. All right, let's do it. I didn't. I don't want. I mean, I'm telling. I love the discussion, and I pro, I actually promote the. I am an advocate of the discussion, but I don't want you to feel like you've right. wasted your time. And you said you don't like being off the grid, so. There's there, there there's no waste here, but I will uh, I, I will try to make no no let the, decisions what, whatever you're comfortable happen. with. All right, William Shatner as T.J. Hooker, or Lee Majors as the Fall Guy. <laughs> I got to go Shatner because the thing that made the thing that takes Shatner over the top is at least at that stage of his career, I don't think he had really caught on to the joke yet. Later in life, Shatner, I think, started to absorb like what the the memes were about him and kind of leaned into it. But like 80s era, wearing the rug, hanging on to a helicopter, doing unnecessary roles and stuff, uh, you know, just fully believing it, thinking that he was the coolest fucking guy on earth and kind of being right, even though he was also hilarious. Is hard to top. So all respect to Lee Majors, but I, I got to go with TJ Hooker on that one. J.R. Richard or Freddie Prinz? J.R. <laughs> J.R. Uh, Richard. No, no disrespect to Freddie Prinz, but J.R. Richard is probably one of my five or six favorite baseball players of the seventies. I had an opportunity to interview him a few years ago. Uh, got to talk to the guy for probably forty-five minutes, and that's one that I will treasure. Same here. That 1981 Astros pitching staff was going to be epic. Uh, yeah, the, the 80 staff where you had Ryan, Richard, and then you could pop Joe Necro in between them just to really – Don Sutton. Diamond. Yeah, it, and I've seen uh, and I've seen pitching staff, and it's a, it's a shame that uh, his career was cut short. I think he was I think he was headed for the Hall of Fame if he had if he'd had better luck. I agree. 16 candles or better off dead. Whoo. Um, uh, better off dead's a good movie, but I got to go with, I got to go with 16 candles, even though that is a movie that can never be made today. Uh, sure. There's my, my, Michael Anthony Hall rapes a chick in that movie. I'm pretty sure you've got a lot of other stuff happening that wouldn't, that wouldn't fly today. Uh, a lot of the a foreign exchange student. Or an exchange student, you've got uh, the uh, the R word is used to describe <laughs> him by Molly yes. Ringwald's grandfather at one point. But particularly the, I mean, Michael Anthony Hall 100% raped that chick while she was incapacitated. And now we have, and we all enjoyed it. And, and she had, fell in love with him. Same as in, in Revenge yeah. of the Nerds. There's the message that you want to get, that you want right. to get Revenge of the Nerds. Same thing. Straight up, Gilbert raped a chick. And then got the chick. I, uh, man, it's it's culturally strange how at the time we were all just like, oh, the good guy, you know. But uh, but I still right. good for him. Yeah, good, good for him. Everybody loves a love story. It's the like adorable rapist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Michael Anthony Hall. It's like he's in one year he went from having John Bender's dope shoved in his underwear to just out there raping girls. So. I don't know the John, not the John, funny. John, it's John not Hughes funny. was not it's John not Hughes funny. was a lot more provocative than we may have realized at the time. Marvin Hagler or Earl Campbell? Oh, baby. That listen, general principle, I gotta side with Earl Campbell on on pretty much any matter. There's few names that you could have did I make it, it tough though? You made me think about it for sure. Uh okay. Hagler was a Hagler was a beast. Best fighter of the 1980s, pound for pound, in my opinion. Vita Blue or Blue Oyster Cult? <laughs> All right. Well, that one's easy. As much as as much as much uh, the Blue Oyster Cult was doing some fine work back in the day, I'm a Vita Blue guy, and I will tell this story real quickly because I'm never going to pass up an opportunity to tell my Vita Blue story because I'm fucking proud that I have a Vita Blue story. Amen. Uh, back when I was doing it, I've got about 100 interviews in the can for an oral history of 1970s baseball. 
that I was planning to write around the time that this Twitter feed took off. Same thing. I was interviewing J.R. Richard for the same project. For a book? For a book. And I've got, like I said, I'm sitting on 100 interviews and Twitter started taking up so much of my time that it's just, I'm waiting for the time when I have an opportunity to sit down and actually put this thing together, which God knows when it will be, but I've got so much great content. I hope to do it at some point, but I had, uh, I had called Vita Blue and gotten his answering machine. And uh, so we're playing phone tag and I, I get a phone call and I look down and I, whatever the number was, I didn't have his name in my phone yet, but I remember assuming it was Vita Blue. It was California or whatever. And I pick up the phone and I just hear this voice on the other line that says, RC, this is VB. And I felt cooler in that moment than probably I've ever felt in my entire life. It was like a three second window there where Vita Blue made me feel like I was just the coolest motherfucker on earth. So um, maybe you are. Maybe Vita Blue was on. Maybe he was just on to it faster than everybody else. But love me some Vita Blue, man. 1971 Vita Blue. He was on the cover of Time Magazine, for God's sakes. You know, that was a beautiful cover, too. Legend. Uh, Reebok's Dan and Dave campaign or Daffy Duck versus Speedy Gonzalez as a rivalry. <laughs> well, you know, I. I Listen, anytime you're bringing Speedy Gonzalez into the equation, it's going to be hard for me to go in a different direction. How I mean, does a duck and a mouse end up as rivals? I mean, they had it. I mean, it was fine with Sylvester. Why couldn't Sylvester? And because Sylvester wasn't allowed to have two rivals, he had Tweety and they had to divvy it up. I don't get it. I mean, look, Daffy Duck was always good for a feud with somebody. He, he Daffy Duck did feuding well, whether it was Elmer Fudd, whether it was Bugs Bunny, you know, they probably just figured, look, he's a disagreeable uh, duck. We can probably create some sparks here. Let's put this duck in Mexico and get some friction yeah. and let's see what happens. See what happens. See, see if the magic happens. And I feel like, I feel like they delivered Tim. David Starsky's Grand Torino or Bo Darville's Trans Am. Oh man, Bo Darville. I mean, I, I'm using the official name, but Bo Darville is the bandit. I look at the end of the day, you you got to go with the bandit on that one. I mean, there's I don't. You got Sally run. Field shotgun, yes. Sally but, Field uh, shotgun, one of the best. But the Grand the Torino movie. is yeah, oh. that's a bad. That's a it's, sweet bastard. It's a sweet bastard. By the way, I know I need to say this just for the record. You used my sweet bastard. You used my pet phrase, big swing and dick. That is my. <laughs> is it? I, it is. I mean, right. I, I mean, I don't tweet it, uh, but I, uh, in conversation, that is my right. version of sweet. All right. I, I won't adopt it in my tweets because I feel like you got to respect each other's shit, you know, but. Uh, I but would be honored if you used it in a tweet because I don't, I can't use it in a tweet. Okay. Well, maybe I'll throw one out there just as a little, you know, as, you'll know. As an homage. Yeah, you'll know when you see it. Who would you rather coach your kid? Coach Chadwick from Youngblood or Coach Nickerson from All the Right Moves? <laughs> Let's say you have a son. Let's say you have this, this fictional son. Who, who gets the chance to coach him? I'm going to go with Nickerson because I feel like my kid's going to walk out of it being a better typist as well. You That's know, true. You're going to get that whole QWERTY uh, you know, expertise work in that, addition to that is a fantastic uh, bit of nuance to that. You're right. Because Chadwick is just coaching. I mean, he's in the juniors right. and he, he's got Nickerson's, no other thing Nickerson's going in on in the goddamn classroom. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, you're, you're getting an extra level of mentorship there. All right. A couple more. Uh, I, I needed to workshop this one. I didn't noodle it around enough, but I think I have a kernel of something here. The sports illustrated curse or Bobby bonds. <laughs> look, look, I got to go with Bobby Bonds, even though, even though he sired a problem. Um, he, was, he was a problem. Yeah, well, you know, he brought it, down as many teams as the Sports Illustrated Curse did. He was so much goddamn fun. I played Appa when I was a kid. I was a, dice, a hell of a player. 
He's one of the all-time underrated players. Yeah. His card was so much fun because you knew you were going to get, you know, somewhere around 20 or 30 homers, 20 or 30 stolen bases. He was going to strike out 175 times back in the era when, you know, you didn't have a ton of people striking out that much. I mean, he was such a fun player and, uh, you know, he's kind of been, I don't want to say forgotten, but I think he's, gotten lost in Barry's shadow and people forget like 30 for 30 is all over the place yeah what a truly dynamic literally all over the place because he couldn't stay on a team for longer than three oh, years. yeah he was he was every what he played for seven eight different teams yeah he made cameos in a lot of different places including including chicago here with uh well with both teams i believe cubs for sure yeah played for the right, crosby stills nash and young or perez morgan rose and concepcion Got to got got to go with the Reds there, and I and I like I like the Marrakesh Express. You know, I'm a you 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 give me a little Judy Blue Eyes, and you know, get a couple of drinks in me. I, I you know I'll be singing along. I I, I do enjoy the uh, C S N and Y, but uh, my God, I grew up in Kentucky, and Riverfront Stadium was the first. Uh, ballpark that I ever got to go to, even though it was 1980 and they were they were disassembling the machine by then. I still got to see Concepcion and Bench, and then later Rose came back, and so I I grew up with the Cincinnati Reds. That's true. That was a that was a question that uh, C, 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 CSNY hey, didn't stand a chance. Hey, listen, you look. Hey, take one look at me. CSN and Y is always in the ball game. You were a roadie. I mean, yeah. I mean, I look like the kind of guy that would be into that. So they they were a worthy adversary, but the Reds are hard to knock off. When the laugh track got added to Mash, or the 1987 Mets. <laughs> Um, I, I got to go with the 1987 Mets because they were, I, I'm, you know, laugh tracks. I mean, I don't know. Laugh tracks are hit or miss. It's the beginning uh, of the end is the, is the, uh, yeah, the, is the metaphor there. The 1987 Mets were still a lot of fucking fun though. They you were. know, I mean, you Kevin still, Elster I, didn't do it for me. I mean, Kev, no, those get, but Kevin Elster, you know, uh, what you had, you had Kevin Elster and, Raphael Sanders. Greg Jeffries was up there. I think he Greg was getting Jeffries a cup of coffee. Was, uh, uh, you know, right at the point where he was becoming the guy who everybody was speculating about his rookie cards and all that good stuff. But you man, think Greg Jeffries has a blue check mark? <laughs> I'm not sure if he does or not, but I can tell you, Greg Jeffries follows me. So, oh no, kidding. So yeah, so I'm a media and and an all time rated stuff. rookie. I think in multiple years. Yeah, I mean he's one of the quintessential prospect he and ben mcdonald just are sort of like they're sort of like han solo uh you know at the uh end of what the empire strikes back or whatever where they're, they're just permanently suspended forever uh, as what ifs you know what what might they have done if uh they had only been as good as we all thought they were going to be when we were hoping that i don't know probably like right about now their rookie cards would all be worth two or three hundred dollars each Instead of a dollar, if that Chinese democracy or Sean Kemp, and this is the last one. <laughs> well, Chinese democracy took so goddamn long. Uh, Sean Kemp is still a train wreck. Wasn't Sean Kemp in the news the other day? Did something yeah, else happen? I, him? Yeah, I, I think there's, and it wasn't minor, I, I don't yeah. believe. It's never good. Somebody did somebody steal something from him, or it, it, I don't even know what it was. Sean, all time best Sean Kemp moment. I'm going to choose Chinese democracy because Sean Kemp embarrassed the game of basketball when at a MTV, some MTV rock and jock bullshit, he got the ball stolen from him by Queen Latifah, who took it the other way and made a layup. Are you aware of this? No. If nothing else comes of this podcast, I want you to go on you Google Sean Kemp, Queen Latifah. <laughs> Queen Latifah picked that man's pocket and went the other way for a layup. I swear on my mother's life. And there is no scenario under which that should happen to you or me. 
<laughs> much less a multi-time NBA all-star. So because of that, even with all the funky dunks and even with the Seattle Supersonics connection, which is worth a lot to me, I'm going to have to side with Axel on that. There's one. also Buckethead on the other side. I don't know if that's a pro or a con, well, but well, let me let's just say that 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 last one was like watching two ugly people fuck, but we had to pick a side. <laughs> so, <laughs> gotta make a choice. It was a binary choice, is what I was told. <laughs> Ricky, all right, thanks for that. We went we went way too long, and that was all my fault because I I feel <laughs> at some point I was taking care of your your hospitality here as we look behind you and at your Galaga, we're right there in your living room You are uh, in suburban Chicago. And uh, you couldn't stop because I kept asking you questions and now I feel guilty. I went rapid fire and that was 35 minutes ago. We went into a rapid uh, fire. Uh, segment. Well, you know, look, it's like somebody said to Bob Dylan, when like a Rolling Stone came out, they were like, that song's too goddamn long. And he said, well, you know, look, there's some three minute songs that feel like they're never going to end. He said, it's okay for a song to be long. It just shouldn't feel long, right? So that, that didn't well, Hopefully like this didn't long. feel long for you. Oh, yeah, hopefully my, it's your audience that I'm concerned about. I, no, I I'm, time, so. Hey, look, it's not often uh, that I land a big swinging dick interview like this. <laughs> and uh, it was a lot of fun for me. And hopefully I didn't feel uh, like I uh, wasted your time uh, was my goal in this. Uh, oh, I, everybody's, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun uh, for for my audience. And I can't thank you enough. Uh, well, Tim, thank you for asking me on. It was a pleasure. You asked me some really great questions because you do get a lot of the same questions after a while. And I wanted not... to make it entertaining for you. At yeah, least. no, it was fun. You kept me on my toes and uh, it, yeah, it was, it was a really good interview and I appreciate you again, having me on and I wish you all the success in the world. I hope that there are some more big swinging dicks or at least slightly above average dicks in your podcast future sir uh lex luger has been on oj simpson has been on oh, trying no. to think of who my big uh who other my big gets have been over the years rob how, gronkowski how did you get oj oh that's a it's a long that, story yeah. i'll be happy to tell you off the air uh, okay. but uh i when i was at the i was working for the buffalo news i interviewed him there and then with the athletic uh we did the 100 greatest football players of all time series last year and uh, for that story, I did not want to, I, I, I went out to Vegas and I interviewed him there and um, it was a story about how he was going to view his legacy through, uh, I think the lens of the, my question is, what do you think the first paragraph of your obituary is going to look like? <laughs> oh, and, wow. uh, because that's the philosophical question, right? Uh, what is going to be at the, the what is going to be in the first sentence or so of your, and uh, he answered those questions and uh, it was, it was pretty fascinating. Was he, uh, but uh, is, he, is he gregarious? Oh, if, if you think he did it, uh, you come away thinking, well, that's how he got away with it. Okay. Uh, but that's also you come if you didn't, you would be like, there's no possible way he did it. Yeah. Not well, that guy. He's too nice. But well, then or but then that's also like, that's how a guy does get away with it. Oh, 100 percent fucking did it. I mean, you know. I, I mean, as sure as sure as I could be, I don't have to, I'm not sending him away forever. So I can, sp I can speak with authority, but I mean, come Tim, he did it right. Well, that's why Jonah has his theories. Uh, Jonah has a conspiracy. Jonah believe well, it, it, conspiracy. He, Jonah is encyclopedic on it. I have not. Okay. Well, sta it, I have not stated uh, one way or the other, well, whether Jonah, or not I, Jonah I thought he did it out on this podcast. He should have hung around Want me to break okay. news. I think, yes, now, he, he Yes, he did. Okay. All right. There you go. We got it from, yeah. see, I got something out of you today too. So I, I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> but no, it's, I mean, my modest podcast uh, was on, this was a, we've been at it for a few years. You know, we've had some big guests, um, but uh, this has been my most entertaining for sure. Well, and I can't Lex, thank you enough. Lex Luger. That's, a, that's another great one. That's yeah. just one that came to mind because it yeah, still gets course, clicked I on listen, today. I, it was a thing. My daughters all know who Lex Luger is because, I mean, now they're too fucking big. But when they were, you know, each one of them was small enough I could. One of the things was, is I would get them up and I would put them in Lex Luger's finisher. And they thought it was the funniest thing in the world, the human torture rack. And they would actually ask me, Dad, Dad, put me in the human torture rack. Okay, in a minute. Uh, so, yeah. Lex Dad, please put me in the human yeah. torture rack. 
Yeah, you know, the heartwarming bond between a father and his daughters, you know. He's a friend of the show. He is considered an F in the TGAF, uh, Tim Graham and Friends. Uh, he's an F. Uh, uh, he's a local guy. He's, he lives here in Buffalo. Okay. Uh, but um, anyways. Cool. NFL folks here, hither and yon, NHLers, you know, whatever. We don't need to go through it. Hey, I Nick don't need McKay. to pump your tires Nick anymore. Nick is a friend of mine, and he's a proud son of Buffalo. And also an F. He has been on the show. Uh, we've, uh, anyways, he's been in my car, let alone on my show. Wow. That's great. Can you, you guys, imagine? You guys just cruising, looking for trouble? We, we actually did one night. Um, <laughs> Dave Winfield has been in my car. That's my, one of my favorite stories. Wow. When I was working at ESPN. We were doing seminars and you have, we're staying at this residence in or wherever we were off campus. And he was part of this interview seminar that I was on because they were anybody, he was an anchor or he was, or he was on the desk and he was doing, so he went through this, this program anyway. And, uh, I drove. Uh, and so when I got there, he was waiting for a cab and I said, Hey, you want to, just to help for the hell of it. I'm like, Hey Dave, you want to lift over there? He's like, yeah, dude. Ended up hanging out for a, for a few days. We went out to dinner and he regaled us with George Steinbrenner stories. It was a lot wow. of fun. Just riding anyway. along Dave Winfield shotgun. That was it. Dave, not, at, which is, that. which is not quite Sally field, but it's up there. Well, you know, you're, you're humble. But now we get down to the last few minutes and you're just, I mean, you've obviously, you know, Lex Luger, you've interviewed OJ Simpson, Dave Winfield's riding around with Donald you. Trump, the whole thing. Donald See? Trump tried to buy the bills. So I interviewed him. See? Oh, it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm bigger than you would even ever imagine. See, this is what I'm saying. You know, you've been very, very kind to me, but I mean, BSD, those are, those are swinging. Those are, those are the <laughs> swinging phalluses right there. <laughs> Ricky, I've enjoyed this. Thank now, you. thanks for pumping my tires. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah, let you go. You got you got better things to do than this. Yeah, a lot of, lot of self-congratulations here as we wrap up. But I feel like we both deserve it, so fuck it. <laughs> thanks, Ricky. All right, thank you, Tim. We'll